When did we become a throwaway society? Every day there's a new trend, a new upgrade. The landscape of our culture is strewn with all that we have tossed aside. It's impacting our families and all of our relationships, really. Funny thing is though, reclaiming and reusing something is making a comeback. What if we began to reclaim the importance of honoring one another in relationship, as a way of protecting those we love, as a way of reclaiming the beauty that was originally intended for our relationships? Children and parents, young and old, students and teachers, and God. It begins with honoring God. Good morning to those who are worshiping in Woodside right now and those who are watching online. Glad that we can be together. We're continuing this series called Honor, Reclaiming What Matters Most in Life. So I'm going to invite you to take out your teaching notes so you can follow along. You'll see the text there that I'm going to read in just a moment. As you're doing that, did you have a chance to hear any of Pope Francis's um, messages this week? I mean, for a guy in his mid-70s, he carries quite a schedule, first of all. Pretty impressive. I was able to get the, uh, the live speech that he gave before the Congress, which is the first time a pope has ever addressed the U.S. Congress. It was already electric in the room, but his opening words um, were really compelling. He opened up by saying, God bless America, the land of the free the home of the brave, and the place erupted in thunderous applause. Because what he was doing was honoring God's idea of freedom. And he was acknowledging that God put this nation on the face of this earth. And the people of this nation have provided a freedom higher than any other nation in all of civilization. And you could just feel the honor in the room. Part of what we're seeking to reclaim is honor. Because we saw a lift in the room and goodness permeated the whole environment in the Congress. Goodness permeated all of that. It was really amazing to see. You know, so grateful for it. Now, you may have differing convictions around the rest of the speech, but it started with honor. And I'm just paying attention to where honor is happening because of this series. Every day, I'm just looking. And what is the experience when it's taking place? Very, very special to see the power of honor and God intending in it. Well, this freedom we enjoy is actually anchored in the Ten Commandments. That's what this series is all about. The Ten Commandments were not to put us into bondage, but to set us free from bondage. The bondage of sin and slavery um, that can control our lives. We're picking it up at the second commandment and few people ever pay attention to the whole context of the command. We tend to take the command which is to have no graven images and just teach and preach on that. We're going to look at the whole context of the command. It's in verses 4 through 6 of Exodus 20. You could follow along in your teaching notes there or take out your Bibles follow along that way. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Just the reading of the whole context, you sense there's a danger in this thing about graven images and making idols. You also sense that there is a recurring temptation that we of every generation experience when it comes to the lure of these idols. And you can see from just the context, the incredible effect, dangerous effect that this can have on our spiritual life and that of our children as well. As we launch into this commandment, let me give you some historical perspective related to the conflict of the second commandment because it's most interesting and helpful to understand. I think um, confusion cries out for clarity. And last week I told you that there are three versions of the Ten Commandments, the Hebrew version, the Protestant version, and the Catholic version. And what we have before us is the Protestant version. That's usually the one that's posted in the public square as well. But those who are Catholic in their family of origin would might say today, like, where are you getting this? Because when I went through catechism, what we're covering today was covered in number one. So we're already landing one of those differences. So one, um, for the Catholics, the, they took c- commandment two and they group it into number one. But we still cover the same territory. But why do we have all this conflict? Well, the pendulum has swung 
Four major times in history. Let me give you just a simple glimpse of it. The first three centuries of the church, there were no images or relics in local churches. Most of the churches were in homes. And then when you know, buildings started to be built, they were free from any kinds of images in the early days. Until the first pendulum swing in 325 AD, when Constantine comes to faith in Jesus Christ. He converts to Christianity, the first Roman emperor. If I could go back in time, there are certain chapters. Do you ever think of this? When I could be alive to see what it was like, to see a Roman emperor come to Christ after all the persecution that came from Rome, it had to be an extraordinary time to be alive. And as a result, of that, he made Christianity, because he's a Roman emperor, the state religion. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people entered into the church, but they didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. They brought their pagan relics and stone idols for worship. And even though the elected officials said, no, this isn't proper, it was very difficult to control this. It's kept seeping into the church for a number of centuries until the pendulum swings back again in AD 787 at the Second Council of Nicaea. And in this council, it's hard for me. I went back and actually read it verbatim because the resource I was looking at, I just said, can this be possible? I went back to the document of the Second Council of Nicaea and read it. I go, it's really true. The authorities in that time and place addressed this issue of idol worship or images, we should say, and relics that people were giving all of this energy to. And they actually affirmed that this was, that there was a place for that in the church. That certain images and relics should be venerated, respected, even worshipped. And they went so far to say that there would be curses given for certain relics and images if the leaders chose not to venerate them. So you can imagine what that created. It opened up the floodgates for the next seven centuries. Statues and paintings and stained glass windows began to just become a plethora in all of our churches. Now, there's a beauty in all of that. When you go see these sites, you're taken by the beauty. You see the good of it. And some of the people of the day did as well, but many of them worshiped these things. And the pendulum swung again. I'll take you to 1566. Don't you love this tour? It's almost as good as being there, isn't it? 1566 the Council of Trent, and they come out with a bold statement. There's so much corruption with people in the church worshiping relics and idols. They come out with a formal statement, verbatim, I want to give it to you. They taught that idolatry is committed, quote, by worshiping idols and images as God. Well, why did they say that? Because people were doing that at that time and place. Or believing that they possess any divinity of virtue entitling them to our worship by praying to, and listen to this, or reposing confidence in them. And so in that pendulum swing, we find that the reformers denounced relics and imagery. And they got a little bit carried away because that's what happens. We get into group think, we get onto that bandwagon and they go in and start taking these relics, these images, these paintings, these sculptures and they start to destroy them by fire and other means. It got a little bit carried away and the pendulum swings one more time believing that the removal was too severe. Even some of the reformers said, let's pull back on this because there was some common sense that images can actually be helpful teaching tools. In that time and place, and for most centuries, most people who walked the face of the earth were illiterate. And how do illiterate people learn? Through visual. We use object lessons. We do that with our children as well. And they say, well, okay, you can't worship, you cannot venerate these images, but you can use them for teaching spiritual growth. Recently, I sat on a panel in a debate with a, a Greek Orthodox priest. It was fascinating, really fascinating. If you've never worshipped at a Greek Orthodox church, it's actually a meaningful thing to go do, but they're kind of classic. So they have icons from the time you enter throughout the whole facility, all kinds of imageries and statues, and, and they all have purpose and they all have meaning. And somebody in the audience raised the question to this Greek priest, to which he responded that there is no one in the Greek church today that worships or venerates these images, these relics, that they're simply teaching tools that enrich our personal faith, exclamation mark. It was interesting to hear him speak about it so poignantly. Let's, get, let's come home here. What about our own building? If you walk around our building, you'll see we have some images of Jesus that, that are in frames and some artwork in various places. How do those things consider, considered in light of this, this uh, commandment? Well, when we were in the dinner theater and uh, started the church in the dinner theater in Shanhassen, 
we didn't have any images or relics because we dealt with the reality of what was the stage because there were performers that were or performances happening. So we had to respect whatever the stage was and we would put cloths over all kinds of things. I, I didn't share this in the other services, but one of my favorite funniest moments, should I say this out loud? I'm thinking. <laughs> This is what happens to me. By the time I'm third hour, I'm really feeling cool right now. I love being with you guys. They had all these things covered up, or we had to cover them up. We walk in for this new set design that they had at the dinner theater, and here's this huge, beautiful portrait of a woman, but she had no clothes on. And I just thought, I think this is going to be a problem for us. You know, so we, we strapped and put tape around that thing and tried to protect it. Anyway, I better move on. So this, we didn't have any of these things. But if I could have kept for you the number of phone calls and e or emails or letters that I received from people who had concern that we didn't have a cross on the stage, it was really bothersome. A lot of people got passionate about that because the cross means so much to us. And so we got a cross. We have a cross in Woodside right now on the platform. We have this cross that's just behind behind me right now, and it's a good thing, I think, overall, when you think about the cross. Is it symbolic? Certainly is. Is it appropriate? Yeah, I think it's very appropriate. Could it be an image inappropriately worshipped? Yeah, it can be, and we need to guard our hearts. Thomas Watson, the Puritan preacher, said in the seventh century, in the first commandment, worshipping a false god is forbidden. In this, however, the second commandment, Worshiping the true God in a false manner is forbidden. So the first commandment points us to the one whom we worship. And the second commandment lays out for us how we worship. And so we're told in one that our focus must be on God alone. And in the other, we're told that we must not accept any other spiritual substitutes. Let me give you a definition of idolatry. Idolatry is worship or devotion of anything other than God. See, many of you are thinking, well, is this commandment relevant for today? Oh, it certainly is. And in fact, you find in Colossians 3, 5, a link of idolatry to covetousness. So when we want something so much, and we covet, we want it to the degree, and we don't have it, we begin to get obsessive around it. The thing can become an idol. And we can seek it rather than to seek God himself. That's what idol worship is. It's a heart deal. So it begs the question, what is God wanting us most to understand in our hearts concerning the second commandment? So I want to speak to you about your hearts in terms of its vulnerability in, in light of this commandment. Well, we know from what I just read that God clearly denounces idolatry. And he gives some very specific guidelines for us. It wasn't just for the people of Israel then. It's as much for us today. There are four of them. I want to call each of them out for you. First of all, don't make idols. They made idols then. We make idols today too. Or we make things at least that can become idols today. In fact, we make more things than they ever thought about making. We are the most productive civilization that has ever walked the face of the earth. We make all kinds of things that can take our devotion. As in verse 4, it says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. It's a call to the classical three-tiered Hebrew cosmology, and you see it here. The Hebrews thought the universe had three levels, the heavens, the earth, and the waters beneath. And there are some who applied this commandment to it, saying this, that when you talk about the creatures above the earth, you're talking about spiritual forces. When you talk about the creatures on the earth, you're talking about material possessions. When you're talking about creatures under the sea, you're talking about death and the life still to come. But it all boils down to one common theme. In every arena of the universe, never represent the creator by anything created. That's the fundamental rule. And it doesn't stop there. He builds on it. God says, don't worship idols in verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. It's one thing to make an idol with your hands. It's another to worship that idol. Do not give to anything your heart of worship and devotion that exclusively belongs to God. And I think that includes statues and pictures and paintings. It includes um, images of reptiles and of birds or any other created order. It could be any of those things that can become an object of your devotion over God. Now, when I'm preparing for the message, I'm thinking in my own heart, 
I'm just going to speak for myself. You may have another issue here. But when I think about myself, there's nothing in me that is inclined to worship a statue, a painting, um, stained glass. There's nothing in me that's inclined to want to, to worship birds or reptiles or whales or any other kind of created being. Now, maybe you're different, but that's not one of my temptations. Does that mean I'm void of the temptation from being guilty of this? Absolutely not. Because there are objects that I find my affection grows great around. And uh, this might be one of yours too. If I, I sat and I thought through, okay, what comes to the list right away? To the top of the list for me, it wasn't even, it was a no-brainer. It just came right to the list right away. And that is my love for cars. I love cars. I think it was one of God's greatest creations for us. <laughs> I love the automobile. My, my, maybe it's a sentimental thing. My father and I worked on cars. So I, I have an affinity thinking of working with my da dad on cars. Um, but when I had come to faith, this was still in me. And I could see potentially there was some inappropriate affection for cars. In my early 20s, I had no money, but I drove this car that I brought a picture of. This is a 1971 Delta 88 455 cubic inch rocket V8 engine. <laughs> this thing could fly. It was huge. It was gorgeous. It got about three miles to the gallon, by the way. <laughs> it, too. It, it was massive. This is our wedding day and we're leaving. It was a convertible. I kept this thing immaculate. It had big white w walls on the, the tires. The, the convertible top had been slashed twice and I invested in getting a better top every time. I kept this thing immaculate. The reality, though, is I wasn't giving to the poor. I'd come to faith in Christ. I wasn't even giving to the church and God's purposes through the church yet. We started attending church. In fact, we got married in the church. This was all new territory. I never learned. Oh, don't put it back up, please. I'm not. There we go. Just hold on to that image a little bit longer. I love this car. It had an inappropriate amount of affection of my life that went to it. I got extra jobs to be able to pay to stay in the car. It, it just, well, it sucked money like you couldn't believe. But isn't she gorgeous? <laughs> I'm talking about my wife, not the car, by the way, because I'm in a new place at this point. I don't need the car. Um, anymore. But in my 20s, I did. I let go of that thing. And it was an emotional deal for me to let go of that car. I was way too invested into it. And I got myself a bomb of a car. And I had never driven a bomb of a car. From the time I was 16 and started driving, I always had a cool car. And I go, no, I'm in a new season. Christ is the Lord of my life. And I went into that. Now, do you have to do that when you're in that given place? No, it's where I was at that time. I could own that car today and be fine because it doesn't have the, I don't have the affection for it the same way. I understand how to manage my affections and my devotions through Christ who is in me is greater than any other thing on the face of the earth. But these are the things we struggle with. Yours may not be a car, but there'll be something else that you give your affection to. What is it? The text also says, never underestimate God's reaction when we do this. Look in verse 5b. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. That God can punish us for idol worship. And if you take a look at the context, not only that, the consequences can have a ripple effect to your children and then to your grandchildren and to their children that's the picture that you have here. It's saying if you give your heart's devotion to things over God, then your grandchildren may they pay the price for it long after you're dead and gone. That's how powerful these things are. And that makes sense to me. I'm an ACA, an adult child of an alcoholic. That my dad had five sisters and brothers. Every one of them were an alcoholic. And they're, the most of them married alcoholics. And it went the generation even before them. So when I think about my life, I, I am so filled with gratitude in my life because at fifth grade, I got one of those GPs I talk about, God promptings, and some are momentous, some are smaller little taps along the way, but he's tapping all the time. And I was only a 10-year-old boy, and I got one of those taps from God. We weren't going to church. There was no spiritual nurture happening there except for my grandmother who was praying for our family every day. There were a lot of change and a divorce and everything that was going on. And I sensed for the first time in my life a presence of the holy other. I can't put words to it to this day. But as I go back and think about it, God was lifting me out of what was generational curse in our family with alcoholism that reigned and reigned and no longer reigns today. All praise to him. Because I listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Because idols got in the way 
of what God most wanted for me and for our family, but it got broken. That's what God does. His grace is sufficient to that end. And all this makes sense to me when I think about how strong God's reaction here is because you see it in the principle of modern psychology. If you visit a counselor to go to get help for whatever given reason, what's one of the first questions they're going to ask you? They're going to ask you about your family. They're going to say, well, what about your mom and dad? And what about your grandma and grandpa? What are you about your brothers and sisters? What about all those other relatives? I mean, they just want to cover the whole territory and you're totally annoyed through the whole thing. You don't want to go back and relive all that stuff because they start touching nerves. Because they start to look at your, your environment that you were raised in, the values that you were raised with along the way. And they look at the childhood experiences you had because you're a product of your past. And to understand your past is to understand your present. God is making this connection. We really embed the DNA from one generation to the other generation. And he's saying, if other things take my place, then the repercussions can be passed on to the next generation so that their want or love for God might be diminished because yours was diminished. God is jealous, it says here, for our love. When we think about God's attributes, most of us don't think about jealousy. We think God is love, God is holy, God is all powerful. But here it says God is jealous. I want you to note something. Many of you have never even thought about this, but the reality is God has to be whole and one together. The holiness of God and the jealousy of God combine. They combine to make the reality of a holy jealousy and a jealous holiness. He works together. It's one of his attributes. We think of jealousy and the downside of it. Jealousy is an emotion of want. And God wants from us the upside of jealousy which I define this way, jealousy as a zealousness for what is right, an utter, total, burning, consuming commitment to hold on to that which is right. This is God's jealousy. He's trying to hold on to us with an intensity and integrity of his being. And he will defend and he will insist of his rightful place at the center of the universe and the center of our hearts. And that's why I say from the time you're little boys, all you little boys and little girls in the room, all you grown men and grown women in the room, you get those GPs and they come to you because that's what God's love does. He wants our undivided affection, our total faithfulness, our complete loyalty. This is the upside. Is that God loves you so much that he pursues you from your time you're a little tot. Through all of your life, he keeps coming after you. And every time you ignore him or blow him off or turn in your own direction, does he blow you off? No, he keeps pursuing you. He wants to protect you. He wants to heal you. He wants you to live a life of freedom. And freedom is found in him, aligning with him and obeying his ways and his will. God is jealous for your love. Just like I'm jealous for Carrie's love and our marriage relationship, I seek to protect it. I don't want any guy looking at her in an inappropriate way. Um, I am intentional to build that relationship so it's a great marriage and not just a mediocre marriage. I'm not going to settle for mediocrity. I'm going to give my best because I'm created in the image of God who has shown me how to love in his given way. It's a jealous kind of love on the upside. And in marked contrast to the statement about punishing children, do you see what he says next? To always remember and never forget love. He talks about punishment. We get uneasy. God, the God of punishment. Yeah, he is. But he's the God of love. And look what it says about love, his love in verse 6. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So for those of us who keep this commandment, God promises to show this loyal, faithful love to a thousand generations. How great is that? The word here in the Hebrew is such a beautiful word. In our English, there's so many Hebrew words and Greek words that get translated into love in English, but we don't see its dimensions, its layers. This word is called hesed love, H-E-S-E-D, hesed love. Hesed love is love par excellence. It's the safety net for all relationships. You find that word every time you you hear God saying that he loves his people for a thousand generations. In other words, forever and ever. It's an undying love and we're the benefactors of it. We benefit from the beauty of God's love given to us again and again and again. And what I love here is in the structure of the Hebrew. Did you pick this up? I want you to notice this. It contrasts the three or four generations with what? Punishment. And it connects the thousands of generations with what? Love. So that in the Hebrew will really bounce off the page for us because he's saying when God speaks firmly, he's always ready to respond and act graciously. It's saying, if you take a close look at it, that the promise is greater than the threat. 
that the reward is always greater than the punishment. That the grace is infinitely greater than ever the judgment is in our lives. So, so that's the, the second commandment, okay? Isn't it a, it's a great commandment because we think it's not for today when it is for today. And yet there may be some who are still skeptical and you're thinking, what's the big deal? You say, what's the big deal? Why does God make such a big deal about idols? And you might identify with the little boy who learned a word at school that he should not have learned, but he did learn. And he decided to share that word over the dinner hour with mom and dad, see how they would respond to the word. It was not a good word. It was a bad word. And they responded like parents when they first hear that word coming out of their kid's mouth with shock and dismay that their innocent, beautiful little child would say that given word. So they banished their boy up to the bedroom, could not finish dinner, would stay in the room all the rest of the evening. And so a, a bit sad and sulky, he went up to his room and 15 minutes after being into the room, a little bit bored, he went to the window, a thunderstorm breaks out. And the, the, the lightning is just flashing and the thunder is crashing and the water from the rain is slashing against the house until the little boy just looks out the window and calmly says, God, what's the big deal about a little word? It's just a little word. And he lost it altogether. The reality is many of us think of this Idol worship is being the same. What's the big deal around this little word? Is it really that big of a deal? It is. Because idolatry can affect your spiritual life. And it can affect it in many ways. I want to give you four. And you may want to capture these with the little thing I want to give you at the end. But let me give these to you. Guard your heart from giving power to the powerless. Because that's what idol worship does. God made us with an inclination to worship him. But if we worship the wrong thing, then we will give power to the wrong thing. And we will let our life revolve around that. We let the created take the place of the creator. And something happens to us when we get into this given place. We become a superstitious people. And we get weird with our superstition. Some of you, um, maybe not in this hour, but in the earlier hours wore purple underwear because you want the Vikings to win today. <laughs> And if you don't wear them, they may not win. Or maybe it's a certain purple jersey that you just have to have if they're playing because that's your good luck charm. We have good luck charms. And we give power to the powerless. Or we have, yeah, I think of this at playoff time, and all the guys wear beards thinking that's going to get us across the victory line. We give power to the powerless. And it just subtly happens. And it happens with fun. But we have to guard our hearts from that becoming a reality in our mindset. I think about that even in a view of the church. I mean, when you think about the church and how, how you understand what the church to be, what do you first think of? The Bible says the church is the people of God. But when you see where all of our passion and our energy and our frustration and our anxiety comes, it's amazing how the things that are powerless become more important to us. Some of you have an image of church that says that's church by the architectural design of it. And therefore, there's a greater ease for you coming into those given places. Some of you think it's the music that we share. There's a certain kind of music that's church and a certain kind of music shouldn't be played in church altogether. Some of you love the traditional. Some of you love the contemporary. You get a lot of emotion in the conversation in the car depending on what you felt about the music and you can give power to the powerless. Or you think about what we wear. I think about the big change we had in starting Westwood at, at a time when things were shifting in our culture concerning church. And we started in the Chanhassen Dinner Theater. For 20 years, every Sunday, I wore a suit with wingtip shoes every single Sunday. So I showed up at the Chanhassen Dinner Theater for the first month every Sunday in my suit and my wingtip sh shoes. No problem. But I was the only one with a suit and wingtip shoes in the room. And all of a sudden, you feel like the odd guy out. What, what am I not getting here? It was a relaxed environment. You didn't wear suits. There was a change in our culture. Look how you are dressed today. Many of you grew up wearing your best for Sunday, did you not? And we've given power to the powerless because we are the temple of God, not the building. But we can do this so easily. And we need to guard our hearts from that given reality. Secondly, we make things more important than the person himself. That God has not revealed himself as a thing, but as a person with whom we relate to. One that we can know and worship and serve and express gratitude with one who has entered into our lives and guides us, giving us direction on where to go, comfort alongside of us, picking us up when we fall. It's important because when we substitute things for him, we don't experience the fullness of relationship. You know what we do? We make God small because then we can be the third expression in control of him. That is putting yourself in control of God. 
To be a Christian means taking the hands off the steering wheel of your life. You've heard me say that a thousand times. But it's really hard for us to take the hands off the steering wheel of our lives because we just have this thing. We want to be in control. Our emotional well-being somehow finds lift when we can trust in ourselves more than trust in God. And so it's hard to take the, the hands off the steering wheel because things become possessions and they give us a small sense of security and even of control. We control God. We welcome God into our lives when we want him in our lives, but not before. Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, whom we're doing um, a lot of partnership with right now at Westwood, he had this prayer in his life that he would um, say again and again. You'll love it. It says this, Lord, I give you the right to change my agenda at any time you like without informing me in advance. is that a good picture? <laughs> um, what a great way to live life. Lord, you're in charge. Yeah, I have my plans. I have my dreams. Yes, I have my personal agenda. But if you want to change any of these things, you can do it. You don't even have to inform me. You're just saying, God, I've released. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I will be who you want me to be. That's the picture. And then guard your heart from remaking God in your own image, thus detracting from God's chosen image. Um, See, we're made in the image of God. You know that. But sin has marred that image. And Jesus comes to remake us back into the image that God first intended for us to have. And so if I make for myself my image by giving my heart to things, so I'm shaping my image, I'm giving this image out to what I want everybody to think about who I am, what happens is I ignore Christ and I deface God's image in me and I can't be available and pliable to what he wants to do in my life and I'm left with an empty life that doesn't benefit him or anybody else. See, God has chosen the image to communicate who he is. And it's declaratively stated for us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. He knows, as Israel did, they looked at all these other nations worshiping gods they could see and touch, that we would have a temptation to find objects because we want to see and touch things to make them more tangible and real. And he's saying, no, his call is for us to focus our devotion on him alone. Elizabeth Elliot says, in one of her books, the Christian life is a process of God breaking our idols down one day at a time because we have these idols that we hold on to in our journey. And God pulls our fingers away from these things that we value too much, knowing at the end of it, when the sun sets on our life, it's us and God, none of those things. So idols can keep you, friends, from knowing that God is real, that Jesus Christ is his son, and even if you've come to faith, idols can keep you from a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to help you a little bit. I sat down with my pen at the end of my prep this week, and I go, boy, for some people, this is still going to feel so theoretical. So I put together three questions to help you think about your own life, to do a little what I will call um, an idolatry inventory. Aren't you glad you came today? An idolatry inventory for today's world. And what I want to do is ask you to think about one thing in your life that you love most and ask these questions against it. First of all, do I want this too much? By that I mean, is the presence of it greater to me than the very presence of God himself? Secondly, has this become too important to me? Do I prioritize it in my life more than I prioritize God in my life? It's become that important to me. Now my driving decisions relate to it. Third, how would I feel if this were suddenly taken away from me? What would it do to my sense of emotional well-being? What would it do to my sense of identity if it was taken away? Would I move more toward God or move away from God? I want to give this assignment to you this week with the hope that you'll actually lean into it a little bit and discern your own heart and what you give yourself to because we all have things we give ourselves to. And I want to conclude my message with a faith story. Mark Plutz, who's a dear friend here at Westwood, He's done his own idolatry inventory and came to learn some things. Today, you get to see him as a man of God who loves Jesus Christ and he lives his life for the glory of Christ in his, his journey. And he and Sarah live in Chanhassen and Carrie and I have come to love them and appreciate them so much. But I want you to hear a real life example 
of an idol worshiper in today's age. How about that? Have you ever been given that title, Mark? So I want you to be real nice to him, would you? Because he's willing to be courageous and share his story. And would you welcome Mark Pletz? Come on out, Mark. Thanks, bud. He's a redeemed, he's a redeemed idol worshiper. Thank you. Thank you. In the other two services, he didn't introduce me as an idol worshiper. Uh, so I feel I may have going downhill. Um, it's, a, it's a weird call to get, right? The church calls you and says, well, we're going to talk about idol worship and we'd like you to do your faith story. Uh, you can determine if it's a fit. It is, unfortunately. Uh, I grew up in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, my sister and I grew up in a very loving household. Uh, we went to church on a regular basis. Didn't really understand why. I was a jock, a little jock. At eight years old, I competed in this event called Punt, Pass, and Kick. Eventually won my city championship, the state championship. Eventually went on to compete at halftime during an NFL football game in Boston. Uh, if I would have won that, I'd have gone to the Super Bowl. So in front of 40,000 people at halftime, eight years old, you know, pretty heady stuff. Uh, I grew up near a tennis court, so I took up tennis. I eventually was a ranked junior tennis player, played collegiate tennis. And my love, like even though I grew up in Maine, my love, like every Minnesotan, was hockey. Um, and so at age 15, I moved away from home. I went to a prep school that was very similar to a Shattuck St. Mary's. It was kind of a hockey factory where you get a lot of exposure to D1 schools. I got offered a number of Division I scholarships. I ended up going to a Division II school where I could get an education called Bowdoin. Um, I played there four years, became an All-American, uh, signed with the Quebec Nordiques in the National Hockey League, a three-year contract and uh, spent three years in the minors. Was well-educated enough to realize I couldn't make a living playing hockey, so I moved on. So you just heard the first 25 years of my life. You didn't hear a lot about the Lord. You didn't hear a lot about God. You didn't hear a lot about Christianity. You heard a lot about me. So unfortunately, the idol I worshiped was me. Didn't realize it at the time. Took me quite some time. I moved here in 1984, traded out my athletic achievements for business achievements. Now the scorecard was money and material items, so I had other things to worship. Great, right? Um, I met my wife, and that changed everything in my life. Uh, she brought someone to the relationship I'd never met before, and that was Jesus Christ. We started to compare notes as we, uh, of our upbringings. Quickly learned we were brought up in very similar fashions. The difference was that she had a book that guided her family, and it was the Bible. I thought, wow. There's a, there's a book that tells you, you know, what to do. And sure enough, that was the Bible. So at the time, the Lord had this confluence around my life. He circled me with ex-jocks, athletic men who are Christians. So it created a safe environment for me to get my questions answered. Uh, and so Sarah and I got married. Uh, we were attending church. The church called one day, asked me if I wanted to run the stewardship campaign. I said, sure. Got off the phone, said to Sarah, hey, I'm running the stewardship campaign. She goes, do you know what that is? I go, no. Um, <laughs> you know, but th that was the arrogance. That's where I was, right? I just, I bulletproof, I could do everything. And she goes, well, you might want to figure that out. So it immersed me in the Bible. And at that stage of my life, I started to figure out uh, rather quickly that all these gifts I'd been given, whether it was the athletic skills, the material items, the money, all those things were God's. And he just entrusted me with them and they weren't mine at all. And that was a very liberating thought for someone who worshiped these things. And it allowed me to stop worship them, worshiping them on a regular basis. Now, Joel talks about the steering wheel. Well, that steering wheel for me was, you know, money, material items, and myself. And I let go of that and I do it on a regular basis, but every once in a while I grab back onto that steering wheel and that never ends well. It's taken me a long time to figure that out. So at that stage, I started studying the Bible and uh, learned what a sinner was. We were at church one day and they were talking about sinners. I told Sarah, we have to go find another church. There's sinners here. You know, we don't want to... Uh, you, you laugh. This is really serious. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. So I have to find another church until I figured out I was who the pastor was talking about. So I quickly figured out that I was a sinner and Jesus Christ had died for my sins. And it was at that time I committed my life to the Lord as being my savior forever. So it hasn't been a perfect walk for 27 years by any means. I struggle with it daily, but I am being transformed daily. I work at it every day. Uh, and for someone who spent his whole life competing and trying to win, uh, and look for the perfect teammate, I finally found him, and that's the Lord. And one thing in the Bible that you get over and over again is this, 
in the end, the Lord wins. And that's very comforting to me. Thank you. Thanks, bud. Isn't that a great story? You know, he's wanted to share for so long. We've talked about it for several years. And I go, there's going to be just the right day when your story is going to be perfect. Idol worship. You're on, buddy. <laughs> Take it out. So, real guy in need of a real God. A real sinner in need of a real Savior. Isn't that all of our stories? So I think as we go today, let's worship the God who reigns today and for eternity and worship him alone. And I'd like to pray as we do before we sing, stand, join me. Thanks, Father God, for worship. The worship you've called us to, you created us for, to worship you. The beauty of your presence, the magnificence of your glory, the goodness of your care for us, each by name and our families. Yes, it does draw us from within to go to our lips, from our hearts, to give you praise, honor, adoration. Receive our worship because you are the reigning God today and for eternity.